Welcome to The Foundry, where leaders are forged daily. And now your host, George Roberts. Welcome back, entrepreneurs. Today we have Charles Dobbins, attorney and founder of multifamilyattorney.com and founder of Multifamily Investing Academy. Welcome to the show, Charles. Thank you, George. Good to see you again. Yeah, great to see you again. And I believe that's a reference to the fact that I was on Charles's show yesterday, Multifamily yes. OS. That was really exciting. So this is back to back recording sessions. I don't know when they're going to come out, but uh, yeah. cool, cool to get to spend two days in a row with Mr. Charles Dobbins. Now I'm the one on the hot seat. So. Yes, exactly. Oh, yes. I couldn't wait to turn it around. <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. why I, that's why I was so gentle to you yesterday, George, because I knew I was going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's start with a softball. Who is Charles Dobbins? I am uh, a, a father, husband, uh, I got four kids, oldest getting married in a couple of weeks, a couple of months. You know, all, I just put my last one through college. Uh, entrepreneur is probably the best description. I've started and run businesses uh, for, even when I was a little kid, I, I was in the insurance business for a while, you know, as a lawyer and uh, worst business in the world to be in. And I finally told my wife, I can't do this anymore. I, I've got to, I've got to get out. Uh, it's, I'm going to die an early death. And she said, what do you want to do? I said, I've always wanted to own apartments. And so I sold my insurance business and we went out and started buying apartments and now I haven't looked back. And now, now what I love to do is help new investors get in this business. Uh, you know, I, I'm a licensed attorney uh, and I act like their attorney, but I'm not their attorney, but they get that type of zealous advocacy on their behalf when I help them through the transactions. So uh, that's, that's what I do. I, you know, investor, um, trainer, coach, soon to be an author, George, but who isn't, right? Nowadays, who isn't? You know? <laughs> Working on my book too. Maybe we'll talk about yeah. that later, about getting that out. So congratulations. I definitely want to talk about the book. So as I understand, uh, in law, you are a multifamily transactional attorney. So, I mean, that's my focus. That's, that's entirely what my practice is made up of. Mm -hmm. I help people from the very beginning. I help you how to teach you how to find deals, how to look for them, how to make offers, how to evaluate the deals, make the right offers, go through the purchase and sale process, go through the due diligence. Every step of the way, I am right by your side to give you the confidence, the confidence that you need to get the deals done. Um, you know, as far as the financing, the funding, we work with you through that, that process as well, helping you build up your investor database. Uh, we really, it's the whole idea, George, and this is what I found, this is where I found things were lacking, was that, you know, you can go on the internet today and find all the information you need in order to, to um, buy a property. I mean, it's all out there, but, it still doesn't give you the confidence to go go and make the first offer to you know be able to follow through and that's where we come in is we give all the our clients the confidence they need to go through the entire process and in addition i know you know one, one thing that when i was first getting started to go around talking to different groups i'd always ask the question what's why are you here what's your goal and you know i want to replace my income i want to get out of my job and then somebody would invariably say I want to own a thousand apartments. And I look at them like, okay, how do you do that? And they say, well, I don't know. That's why I'm here. I said, well, I know how to do that because I've done it. Let me show you how to do it. And the problem is that you don't get to a thousand apartments on one transaction. Right. It's building a business, creating the systems that you need to run that business. And that's, that's what I teach my students. Yeah, I love it. It's uh, it's hard. You're right. Uh, when you look for the information about multifamily or commercial real estate investing, it that uh, building of systems that's always further down the road. Yeah, uh, that's not usually video one or video ten. You really exactly. gotta, in most cases, find a course. Yeah, and that's why we teach it right from the beginning. I mean, ninety percent of all businesses is sales and marketing, and you have to understand sales and marketing in the multifamily business to be to be a success. And so what we do is if you are not an expert at sales and marketing, we have a team and we have a system that we turn on for you so you can start finding the deals before anyone else does. 
Great, great, great. And uh, I think we go any further. I want to say that I think you also have a quote about consistency. I don't know if you're thinking of the same one, but I think it was about prospecting that you can miss a day. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, are you talking about the one the, the one that I learned from my insurance days where um, prospecting is a lot like shaving? Yeah. You got to get up and do it every day or you're going to look like a bum. Exactly. I yeah, love yeah, it. that's cool. I love it. Yeah, so it reminds me of my new webcam. So I, I've got a webcam here that makes me look handsome even when I don't shave. It just well, somehow it just highlights the stubble. Oh, so, I was going to say, yeah. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you, you've totally changed since yesterday. I mean, you obviously yeah. were using a different webcam yesterday, right? Yeah, no, on my show. But um, have you seen those new webcams that are the, the center cams? Uh, where the, it, it clips on the top of your computer and the right cam the camera's right smack dab in the middle of the screen. Oh so I'm looking like right at you as I as I talk. I'm, I gotta get one of those. Gotta get me one of those. They're All called right. center cams. I find I like them it. I find them, George, where I find most of my good stuff. TikTok. So yeah, yeah. A lot of great ideas on TikTok. Don't, uh, don't discount it. You can find me on TikTok too. Me I'm too. Kidding. Me too. I got a channel. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. I got to go find you on TikTok. Yeah. Just like yesterday, I'm, I'm, uh, I can't help myself. I'm scribbling notes. I got to follow up on some of these things. All right. Well, you're scribbling notes. And, and George, you, I mean, I know what a techie kind of guy you are. Do you have one of these? Uh, or are you talking about what, remarkable? That's what this is my, how I, uh, it's my, um, it's how I scribble notes. So I write like, you know. Oh yeah, you got a, like a fancy notepad there. Oh yeah, this thing is the best. Oh, oh, I, it's it's electronic now I got oh, yeah. it. Oh, oh you'd, yeah, George, you would love this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good, that's good. But you know how it is when you're at these uh, adult meetings and you, you're trying to uh, take notes, you can't be on the laptop or your phone. It just doesn't look right. But then if you put it on paper, then what are you going to do? Be your own secretary all night? You know, it's so funny <laughs> you say that because that's where I found that thing is at one of these adult meetings where I went, yeah. I went, uh, I'm a member of Dan Sullivan's uh, strategic coach uh, uh, co course. And I go to Chicago uh, once a quarter and I'm sitting in there with a bunch of other entrepreneurs and the newest slickest gadgets are always in these guys' hands. And so right. it was an iPad or the Remarkable. So I got the iPad because I thought, ah, oh, this one's going to be more, you know, do more things. I had it for like two months and my wife says, hey, can I have your iPad? I said, please take it. I, I, I don't like it. And then I went out and got the Remarkable. And that was the other thing that everybody was using. And I, I love the Remarkable. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. From listening to a pitch through Zoom, I can just uh, blaze away at the keyboard. But, you know, if you're in person watching yeah. a pitch, you know, you just you can't do that. And yeah. so... That's perfect. So I may have to go look that up. And that center cam, that's another thing I need to look up because the whole time I want to look at you on the yeah. screen. But when I do that, it looks like I'm looking away. Exactly. I'm not looking at my cam. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I thought when I saw that, I'm like, what a brilliant idea. Why didn't I think of that? You know, it's one of those right. things. I wanted so. to solve it through software. I just want to know how come Zoom just can't push your face up towards the top or let me rearrange it, not just right versus left, but let me put you next to the camera so I can, I can watch you and still look at the camera. But yeah. uh, there you go. Yep. There's a, there's a physical solution. It's called the center cam. Yes, exactly. Well, so you've already told us uh, the background of how you got into multifamily. You just, you had like this soul crushing corporate job and you just, decided you were going to get out of it and, and you knew what you were going to do. But I don't think you've really told us a whole lot about the progression. So how did you build your business from, hey, I, you know, I know how to sell. I'm an attorney, but I've never owned an apartment building. Yeah. How did you get there? Great question. So, you know, my wife and I, you know, signed up with all those gurus. We went to all the boot camps, all that type of stuff. We really learned how to do it. And, you know, I sold my company. I burnt the ships. I was not going back in. I, I had to find something else. And that's when I started doing, uh, you know, making offers. That's the key. You got to make offers in this business. My goal early on was I just wanted to buy 20 units. That was my initial goal. And we picked out a couple of different places around the country. My wife's from the Midwest and the, um, you know, that was really kind of where we focused. We never looked in my backyard up here in uh, Boston, the Boston area, just everything was, was too expensive. Uh, so we found 
the Cincinnati marketplace. We, we hooked up with a couple of brokers. And there was one broker in particular, as she said, listen, I know what you're looking for. And when I find it, I'm going to call you and get your checkbook ready. So I said, uh, okay, all right, that sounds good. About two weeks later, she calls us up and she says, I got a 128 unit property. Like, oh, oh, I don't know if I can do 128. I, all I want to do is 20. She goes, well, they're built in different phases. Maybe we can peel off some of the phases and they'll sell you parts of it. So there was a class A section, a 40 unit class A section. She said, could you do the 40 unit? Uh, and I said, yeah, I guess so. And so we peeled off that 40 and we got it under contract. And remember, this was about 2006. So the market was still frothy. Everybody was making money. We get it uh, under contract. We needed to raise money. We, we, it took us about nine investors to raise the money we needed, uh, friends and family. Uh, we closed on the deal. We needed about, I think it was about 600,000 is what we needed uh, on the deal. So we, we, we um, closed on the deal and we owned 40 units within about six months of me getting started in, in the business. And then the bank, we became friendly with the bank and they said, hey, we like you guys. We like your balance. You like working with you. The owner of that 128, who now only owns 88, we don't like. And we're going to take his property back. And would you guys like to buy it? And I said, uh, I just closed on 40. I don't have any more friends and family to tap into. I've already tapped them all. And they said, well, how much would you need to close? I said, I did this quick calculation. I said, I need about $750,000 to close on this thing. And the bank said, and I'm on the phone with the bank, the bank said, what if we lent you the money? And I said, hold on one second. I turned to my wife, who's a banker. I said, the bank is going to lend us the down payment to do this deal to get the 88. What do I say? She said, ask them how quickly we can close. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I said, okay, let's do it. So within six months, I went from a goal of 20 units to owning 128 units. And uh, I tell you, every property I've purchased has been a learning experience. There's always something going on. I'm amazed. My students are, are like amazed at me that I can tell them what's going to happen throughout the whole entire progression because it's always the same. Nothing changes. And I've done it a million times. But there's always some, some little wrinkle in every deal that, uh, that makes it interesting. And so that one, um, you know, we kept, we held through the, through the, uh, the crash. Um, we owned it in two different investor groups. Um, the, the class, the, the, the 88 units, I, I always teach my students, you've got to learn to buy property the right way. And right, what I mean by that is you've got to capitalize your business, meaning you have to put the money in. All business requires capital and multifamily is no different. I made more money on that 40 unit than I did on the 88 unit. The 40 unit cash flowed beautifully every single month, never a problem. The 88 unit, I broke even because I didn't buy it the right way. I bought it no money down. And so that was a learning experience that, you know, you can sit there and say, uh, you know, it can do deals, no money down, but it doesn't mean you're going to make any money. So a, a, the right way to buy property is to make sure you have the capital to get into the business. And it doesn't have to be your capital. I didn't use my own capital when I bought those properties. I went out there and, and raised it through friends and family. So that is uh, probably one of the first lessons I learned in this business is that, you know, it's, you can lose money on multifamily. And, you know, if you don't buy it the right way, uh, and that's, that's what I do is I protect people from uh, that happening. Great. Another one of, uh, I believe, your favorite quotes is that success is a poor teacher. It's the mistakes, the missteps, the difficulties, the hurdles that really teach you the most. Now, you got into the business in 2006, so you certainly you had to weather that great recession. Yeah. And then you've also seen COVID, and that also threw us a much smaller curveball. But again, yeah. uh, I, maybe you could say we're in uh, curveball number three right now because uh, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen next. I think most of us believe that an inflation and area environment is gonna be good for real estate, but we don't know exactly what's, what's coming. So can you tell us uh, what were some of the lessons that you learned from the ups and downs of the market? Oh man, um, non-recourse is the way to go. 
I've owned uh, personal recourse loans that got foreclosed on. That was tough. Uh, we fortunately we had a great relationship with the bank and they they waived the recourse. Um, but I would now I tell my students don't do recourse if you if you uh, can't if you can get out of it don't do a recourse, especially in today's climate because we don't know what's going on. Just watch a Marcus and Millichap report on on climbing uh, cap rates. You know we're, t we're I'm seeing more and more of my students' deals are falling out of contract right now because of, of the interest rates uh, than ever before, and you know we just don't know where we're going. So don't get yourself locked up in a recourse uh, personal recourse deal. Uh, that you might find yourself in big trouble in three to five years from now. So that's one of the things that I learned. The biggest thing is that it's a business. You've got to run it like a business. You've got to have great systems, uh, accounting systems, property management systems. Uh, and when you do it the right way, everything flows beautifully. I was slow to hire, quick to fire. I, you know, we had great property managers on our property. I own the, I own the property management company which is what I also teach my students because that's that's the way to do it. I mean, you can, this whole concept of, of passive investing. Yeah, you know, I'm a passive investor in Coca-Cola too. But if you're, you know, in a multifamily business, if you're looking to be in this business, it's not, I remember one guy calling it mailbox money. Like, you know, that may be true, but if you're the, if you're buying this thing, this is a, it's a business, you're going to work. Right. Best business in the world, but, but you got to stick with it. So from the, from the, those types of things, uh, you know, with the market, I've lived through so many different real estate cycles. Chris Porter uh, and his partner, John, I can't remember John's last name, uh, wrote a book, Big Shifts Ahead. And they, um, they uh, talked about guys in my generation, guys who were born in the 1960s, and they broke up all the generations. So everyone call, call, would call me a baby boomer. They said, no, you're not, we, we don't believe in baby boomers because that's 46 to 64. And I'm 60, born to 64. This guy was, you know, a guy born in 46 has got nothing in common with me. So you had to rejigger the, the decades. So the people that were born in the 60s are retiring with less equity than any other generation before them. And the reason is because we have weathered more cycles, more real estate cycles than any other generation. We're, we've already been through three. We might be going into our fourth right now. So I have watched it. I'm on the right side of this cycle. I'm ready to get in there and start buying uh, when the prices hit rock bottom again, which they did last time. And, um, you know, really funny, funny, George. I, I'm on the... the um, uh, Cornelius Cannon's uh, multifamily shark pool, and I'm one of the sharks, and I'm the I'm the mean shark, uh, and you know, I I'm the mean shark because I just call it like I see it, and I tell people straight up. And I had this investment group on pitching their deals, and they were showing their 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 pitch deck, and they started showing properties that they currently own in their portfolio. And one of the properties that they own is a property that I lost back in 2009. And I went, let them go through the whole thing. And I said, so what are you going to do, you know, if interest rates start to creep up? And this guy starts to pontificate how, oh, that will never happen. Oh, that's, oh, you know, it, exactly, exactly. And I'm like, and he was a young kid. And I was like, hey, let me tell you a story. And this is where I like, I put, you know, was able to jump on it and say, let me tell you a story. Back in 2008, <laughs> I purchased a 222 unit apartment complex in Lexington, Kentucky. And George, you saw their eyes get wide. Like you own that property? He said, yes. And when the interest rates took off and the cap rates uh, started to rise, I couldn't refinance that thing. I had to give it back to the bank. And they said, wow, oh my gosh, that's great. And I got on, listen to this, George. I got on CoStar while I was, while I was sitting there on the call and I was able to look at the, the full his, history trans, of transactions on that property. I bought it for seven and a half. The special servicer who took it back because it was a Fannie loan, yeah. the special servicer uh, sold it to some guy, not even an LLC, just some guy, but $3 million. Four years later, he sold it to this group for seven million dollars, wow! That guy made four. He made my four million yeah. that I never got. He made he made it. So I'm going to be that guy during this next go round. Yeah, great story. And I have to say, uh, I do love Cornelius Cannon. I love yeah. his show. I do tune in. 
And uh, my favorite shark is Mr. Personality. So I think I'm going to enjoy your commentary. Somebody has to say what needs to be said, right? I mean, you Amen, can't- brother. Just... Amen, Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to protect people, you know? Good. And uh, I'm here to protect granny and her money. Uh, make sure she doesn't lose it on these bad deals because her grandson is, you know, thinks he's going to be a multimillionaire. Yeah, sobering. Uh, I was going to ask you if you had any- insights on the economic landscape but you just dove right into it you you got there first any additional insights yeah. in the economic landscape any predictions where you think we're headed i mean i'll just frame it right now we're in the end of the first week of july and uh rates have already taken off like crazy you might be watching this if you if you catch it when it comes out uh beginning of august and still you see residential rates have jumped way mm -hmm. higher than yeah. commercial and we, we know where it's headed, uh, or at least we think we know. And and anyway, what where do you want to take it from there? Well, what I want to take it at more of the micro level, because, you know, you're seeing these deals starting to fall through. I mean, right now we're in the process of, of selling one of our properties uh, and the, the seller just came, the buyer just came back to us. He needs an extension. One of his, yeah. his investor groups fell out and I said, OK, fine, you know, $300,000 earnest money and OK, he'll put it down. Uh, but we're starting to see that happen more and more. And that's going to really start to uh, impact these uh, sellers. You know, it was the longest time the sellers felt they could get these crazy prices for their deals. Yeah. And it's, there's always that that is a lagging indicator, meaning like now it's going to take a couple of years for those investors to find out, hey, I can't get what I thought I could before. And that's when they're going to start dropping the prices. So it's going it, to it's it's a. It, there's a delay factor with these rising interest yeah. rates. Uh, people are sitting on it, but sooner or later, guys have to have to do the deals. Their notes come due, and if those cap rates go up, which they will because of the interest rates. And granted, I got in a big discussion with another guru that interest rates and cap rates are not, you know, they don't run with each other, but they actually do. I mean, when I mean when interest rates go up you can't buy as much property. You still have to get the right. same yield you were getting. You can't buy as much property and therefore, you know, the prices have to come down. So the interest rates, uh, and once these cap rates start to start to go back up again, and then the deals have to be refinanced. Right. See, that is what killed me. I never missed a payment on any of my properties, but two of them went back to foreclosure because yeah. when the notes became due, we couldn't refinance. We'd have to come up with a million dollars because that's how much value the property lost. And that's really when it's going to start to get hard. And really, you know, that's when opportunities are going to start to come in. Right. There's a lot that I would love to dig in there. Uh, the first is these people who think that if interest rates go up, that cap rates don't have to go up. I've never seen any of those people explain to me how people would like to be negatively leveraged. Because yeah. I know I would. <laughs> yeah, like you know, the yield, the yield, uh, yield curve is inverted. Well, what, 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 what? I mean, dogs with cats, it's crazy. Oh uh, right. yeah. <laughs> and then the other thing is that uh, you know we all know how commercial real estate is valued. You know, you've got your net operating income, you've got your cap rates, but uh, I get this feeling that just because the central equation of commercial real estate, just to coin a term, uh, doesn't have interest rate in it, that somehow that it doesn't impact things. It's immune from it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's right. You, I mean, that's why I said, I want to talk about it on the micro level. Let's, let's like, what happens to a person, to an investor when he has to buy more expensive money? Yeah, exactly. He's, he's got to pay for it somewhere. And, you know, that's, that's a difference. So, and like yeah. you said, it comes out of the income. Uh, from right. the property because that's what that's all we care about. Exactly, and we do talk about cash flow that that's what it's all about. Many people would say that, and boom, you know, there's there's your cash flow when the interest yep. rates go up. Poof. Yep. Yeah, and just to get back to uh, one of my favorite investors, Benjamin Graham, the intelligent investor. You know, when you what you have to do is you have to you want you want to make your decisions on the basis of analysis. You have to look at the expected returns, the safety of principal. And when those returns diminish, there's nothing more rational to do to either find a different asset class or you're going to lower your price and probably yeah. both. 
<laughs> yes, you know that's I, I didn't I'm not familiar with 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 that gentleman you just quoted, uh, but I've I've heard you know other people talk about factoring in the expense of risk. Yeah, and taking that into consideration when you're evaluating right. the asset class, and people don't do that. Uh, you know, it was a risky. Uh, think about it. Back yes. back in during the last crash, multifamily was risky. Yeah, you know, and it's uh, you know I don't think it ever will be will be, but th there were times when it was people were moving their money out of multifamily, putting it somewhere else. So you have to drop your price then. Tell me about it. Tell me yeah. about it. Yeah, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, there you have it. I think people really need to take a wider view, and it and it's like that with anything. I mean, even if you do. Uh, Securities analysis. I mean, why is it that you might have uh, some companies might have a, a price earnings of 20? Uh, the oil companies, they may have something in the single digits right now. You got shipping companies that have sub one price earnings ratios right now. And it's all about the quality of earnings. Well, what's the likelihood that they make that much money next year? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sooner or later, it's going to pick up, you know? Yeah. So, well, anyway, <laughs> yeah. I think you would agree with me that there are going to be a lot of players uh, washed from the stage in this uh, upcoming turmoil, probably yes. a lot fewer in commercial than in single family, but it's going to happen. And I think a lot of people, I don't think they see it as a business. I don't think they're really seeing it as an investment and, and applying proper analysis, just pl plugging numbers into a spreadsheet. That's not going to protect you, is it? Right. You know, I, that, I love what you just said. Uh, there have been, uh, Paul Moore is a good uh, friend of mine. He's written a couple of books and, uh, you know, I've had him on my podcast. He's been on, I've been on his, but he wrote a blog post for uh, Bigger Pockets. And in it, he said that the real investors, the real multifamily investors, operators are the ones that can withstand anything that happens in the market because they bought the property the right way and their job is to drive and to force the appreciation through driving the NOI. That's how they get their value. If the market shifts, well, okay, maybe it's gonna hurt the value, maybe it's gonna increase. But regardless, if the market stays the same, this was a good investment because I'm a good operator and I know how to get money out of this property. Those are the real people that you wanna be uh, turning to and working with. I'm telling you right now, and I've seen it, George, I've seen so many of these new syndicators who have never been through a cycle. Right, I've never right. known what it's like to live, uh, you know, have a Fannie and Fr Freddie showing up at your door saying time to turn over the keys. They've never lived through that type of environment. Uh, so they don't know. They just think, hey, everybody makes money at multifamily. Hey, bravo to them. They've had a great run, uh, but they better be ready. Uh, you know, and, and I tell you, on that that shark pool um, uh I watched them and, oh, you, oh, George, you said it yesterday when we were on the call together mm -hmm. uh, about you don't look at any deal unless there's at least a $400 spread in the rent yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, for a value add. And I look at some of these deals and I'm, they're, they're trying to pitch me and I'm, I'm doing my analysis yes, while I'm yes. on the floor with them because everything's at your fingertips. I said, you don't have enough room in this. You, you just yeah. can't do it. And uh, yeah, it's the last one I did, the, uh, that's what I did. That one of, the, one of the investors came back and says, well, your calculations are wrong. I said, no, your calculations are wrong. Mine are right. And well, you're not going to make a dime on this deal. Right, so, right. You know, I wish yeah. them all the best. Wish them all the best. <laughs> and the problem is, George, you want, and here's the other thing, George, the thing that kills me is if you're doing it for the acquisition fee, that's the worst reason to be doing a deal. And that's what I think a lot of these, these syndicators are all about. They just want that, that acquisition fee at the end of the day, and they don't care what happens to the deal. That's, that's too bad. That's, that's a shame. Right. Well, uh, very frightening. And you mentioned uh, what I would say is the old gold standard, or no, actually, I'm sorry. I was going to say the old gold standard was, have you gone full cycle? But the real gold standard is what you just mentioned. Have you gone an actual economic cycle? Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 And just so everybody understands, George is talking about two different cycles. The right. full cycle would be you buy one, you sell one, you cash right. out. The economic cycle is you've gone through that up period and the down period, and you you, you came out on the other side. Right. That's the real standard. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, obviously, I think there's going to be a reordering. A yeah. Lot of reordering. Yeah. 
So yeah. to, to make the most of that reordering, I would say uh, what I would be looking to do is build great relationships with the banks, just mm -hmm. like you did. I mean, right from the get go, you had that great uh, relationship with the bank when they decided to take that property back from the developer. Uh, you were right there to, uh, to swoop down and, and grab it. Uh, anything else you would say that would prepare people to take advantage of the potential economic carnage coming? Okay, first off, start talking to your potential investors about what's coming, because, you know, that's say, listen, you want you, we're, we're going to run in when everybody else is running out, just like just like Warren Buffett does. But also, let me give a little tip to everybody. And I teach this in my, my class at how to find deals where no one else is looking. What, what, what you want to do to follow up with what George just talked about is go to BauerFinancial.com, Bauer as in the hockey skate, B-A-U-E-R, BauerFinancial.com. That is a national ranking of all the banks. And they give me one, one to five stars. Go to the banks in your region where you are, are doing your deals. Like if South Carolina is focused in that one particular area and start going through all of their websites and find their, their real estate owned section. And some of them have it flat right in there, real estate owned. Real, and you'd be amazed at some of the crap that, they, that the banks own. But you want to start working with the person in that department, because when things start coming back, that they're going to, you want them to call you to remember you. So focus in, you know, bring it right down to the local level, focus in on those uh, particular uh, markets and, and find the banks and get to know that local banker who, who controls the strings. So that's, that's definitely the way to do it coming up. I love it. I think that if uh, the listeners get just one amazing piece of actionable intelligence out of this 30 or 35 minutes that I would say your time is well spent. Many such moments in this interview, that's one of them right there. Yeah. Get to know that person, build that relationship. And if that's the only one you get, you should have been listening from the beginning because I've been a genius throughout this whole conversation. <laughs> I'm telling you, rewind it, rewind the tape. <laughs> All right. Awesome. You know, I think we've hit on a lot of this already, but I like to ask everybody one question these days, and that is in this raising, uh, rising interest rate environment, what are you doing to change your execution to survive and thrive? Well, right now I am moving. I know people are going to yell at me at this, but listen, I'm moving everything into cash right now so I can deploy it immediately because I, I'm, we have one more property to sell. It was supposed to close yesterday. That one's gonna, once that closes, we'll be all cash. And within the next 12 to 24 months, I wanna go out there and deploy it. So don't yell at me out there that, you know, you, I need to be in a hard asset, you know, because inflation's gonna dig away at that, that dollar that I've saved. I get it, but I will make it all back when I buy the right property at the right price in spades. So that's, that's the ultimate end game here. Love it. Building my own cash position as well. Uh, let me give you some bad advice that I hear. I'd like to hear what you think, if you think this is bad advice, but people just say, well, I'll just leverage it less. You know, I'll just, I'll just put a larger down payment. Now compare a larger down payment versus having a, a cash position, having those reserves. Yeah, because once you give it give it to the bank, you can't get it back, and that thing's going to be locked up for the next seven years. And your opportunities are going to are going to come and go because you you've deployed your cash somewhere else. Um, and obviously, when you when you when you do that, geez, I don't see the benefit of that. Oh, the, the reason you're going to have to do it is because banks are asking now for more more down. I mean, you're not getting some of those deals True. are not penciling True. out at eighty percent. Uh, but the thing is, you, the reason why you do it is because the numbers aren't working in the first place. You aren't getting the returns. So you got to put more money down, which that is going to hurt your returns even more. Um, so, no, I don't uh, I don't like that idea, but I am still very conservative. I don't I, you know, I don't over leverage. I mean, look at how we started this conversation. I had one property that I bought with 75 percent LTV, a, another property that I bought with zero percent. You know, or or 100 down, 100 uh, seller financing, uh, bank financing, 100, and I didn't make a dime on that property. So you know, mm -hmm. I I'm still pretty conservative when it comes to making sure that the, the sleep number, my sleep number, is a good one. And for those of you that don't know what that is, that's what I call the debt coverage ratio, debt service coverage ratio, is my sleep number. The higher the number, the easier it is for me to sleep at night. Um, yeah, so that's uh, I don't I, don't, I, I guess I don't think that. 
I don't see the benefit of doing that, you know, putting down more, uh, more down payment to reduce the leverage on the deal. Good. Yeah. I, I'm glad. I, I just want to crush that. If there's one thing I'd like to crush in this business, the, the, those people that are saying that I'd like to protect people too. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to go next to something I've gone back and forth with. I'll give you another, what I think is maybe a little bit dodgy bit of advice. People say, oh, go for class C because, you know, when people, uh, you know, they can't afford the class A, they'll go to class B. The class Bs, they can't afford it, they'll go to class C. But we saw during the coronavirus that that's absolutely not the case. It was the class Cs that got crushed. And of course, that was because of the governors. The governors said, um, you know, hey, food service is... Uh, you know, it's, it's non-essential. I don't know about you, Charles, but I, I, I eat quite a bit. I'm known for it. In fact, I don't think food service is not essential, but regardless, it wasn't my call and, and, and those places got crushed, but here's the curveball for you. Um, I, I know you also agree with me that, uh, there's nowhere for cap rates to go, but up, they certainly, I don't think are going to get uh, further compressed. And so, uh, I don't want to be in class C for, for the reasons of A, you know, they, they do get crushed in a recession sometimes. B, you also have the, the issue of financing, right? I'll yeah. do a reposition if I can get seller financing. I don't want to bridge. All right. So, so <laughs> and I throw a lot at you there. So, yeah. so where do you want to take that? I mean, it, class, class C, are you for it, against it, and, and why? Okay. Listen, I get in trouble for my position all the time. And I, what, I tell this joke, uh, I have a bumper sticker on my car. Uh, that says life is too short to own C-class properties. And I was, I was given that speech one time down in Newport, Rhode Island, and uh, Chris Prefontaine, uh, who was running the show, he said, do you really have a bumper sticker like that? I said, no, nah, I just say I do. He says, you should get one. And so I went out and I bought a whole bunch of bumper stickers that said just that. I used to give them out at, at all meetings. I'm all out of them right now. But I, so my point is this, C-class property, I heard it once said, is like catching a falling knife. You got to catch it at just the right time or you're going to get cut. And the, the thing is, I say that about C-Class. And then I, I have one particular student of mine up in your neck of the woods. Uh, great, great guy. He and his wife uh, own and operate their properties 100% their own. And all he does is C-Class. And he makes millions. And he does incredibly well because of the C-Class properties that he buys. But he does it the right way. Now... The way he does it is he gets in there, renovates everything. Yeah. Everything is brand new in that property. And it's like he's got he's got an expense ratio of like an A-class property when he's yeah. done. And the property cash flow is like a pig. And so that's a great way to do C-class property. Uh, but other than that, you know, I have a great practice, law practice. I don't have the time and energy to do what it takes to own and operate C-class property. Mm. I like the best properties I've ever owned are the ones that I forgot I even owned. Yeah. And that like the first one, that fir first unit I, I, I uh, first 40 units that I bought, that was an A-class property. That was, that was the easiest thing to run. C-class properties, I had 116 units in Texas. I had six employees working on that property and I couldn't make it work. That thing was a disaster. Uh, so, you know, you have to really be by the C-class property the right way at the right time at the right price and the right location uh, to really make it work. All these people that talk about, let, let me tell you another fallacy in this business mm. is if you, you know, come out of some guru's boot camp and you learned, oh, I'm going to buy a C-class property in a B area or a B property in an A area, <laughs> and you've never been to that area before. Right. You know, you call up some broker in Fort Worth, Texas and say, listen, I'm uh, looking for a C-class property in a B area. That guy's going to hold the phone down and he's like, hey, guys, I got another one from that boot camp. Here we go. Sure, I got just the property for you. And then, you know, you don't know <laughs> the neighborhood. You go out there and it's like, okay, so this is a B area? Yeah, this is a B area. Perfect. And then you get in and then you find out. No, this area is riddled with crime. It's it's the worst area to be in. No, what, but I didn't know that because I'm not from Fort Worth, Texas. So, you know, and, and 
of course, if you call a broker and you start off a conversation that way, they're going to just laugh at you because everybody wants that. So, you know, that's, you know, you got to be careful. Uh, see, I think there's too much risk. Getting back to the question of risk. I think there's too much risk in a C-class property. Would you put your grandmother's money on a C-class property? Uh, I would. Good I would. one, good one, good question. Yeah. Well, I've been going back and forth on C-class. Uh, I mean, if I think I can buy it right, and, and that's the way I do it too. My C-class, uh, we have a great, great construction leader on site, yeah. and uh, he's turned it into true B-class. It's hard to go yeah. up a whole grade, but uh, we've done at least that much over there. Yeah. And uh, it's it's a completely different property in the area it's turning to. So a lot, you know, of, a lot of factors, a lot of factors. This whole thing about uh, repositioning, mm -hmm. there are two elements to repositioning. And nobody ever talks about the second one. The first one has to do with the putting the facelift on the property, mm -hmm. bringing it from a C to a B, just in the quality of construction. All that takes is money. Anybody can do that. And you can, do, you can turn a D-class property into the Taj Mahal with enough money. But if you can't get those B-class tenants to move into your building, your repositioning has failed. If you can't get that person who's, who, you're, who you're going after to get the higher rents, doesn't want to step over chalk lines on the sidewalks, you know, every every Sunday morning, you know, they're never going to move into your property. Yeah, I tell you, you're not you're not lying because halfway through the repositioning, there were a lot of people who made appointments with us, and they just turned around to the parking lot. But now it's yeah. a different story. Yeah. Outside is completely different. Inside is ten shades different. Yeah. But yeah, it's 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 not an easy, not an easy way to go. Well, I don't know where to go to, to get away from the cap rate uh, expansion issue. So I'm I'm thinking about C class, but like you, I'm also going into uh, cash. So I want to say I love it. I feel like if you listen to this interview uh, and you take this advice that uh, potentially a lot of people can be protected. That's my mm -hmm. goal for today. So right. how about this? I'll just wrap it up with. Uh, anything else you want to discuss? And if not, we'll head into the lightning round. Uh, no, I never put you through a lightning round, George. I just want to tell you that right now. So you go easy on me, all right? And I didn't read the questions. I, you know, I, I didn't cheat ahead of time. So this is all going to be, uh, you know, I get to, I get, I get the edit button. I get to push the edit button if it comes out wrong. But, all right, go ahead. Go ahead. Hit me. Hit me uh, with okay, that. okay. All right, so uh, so here we go, and and it's true you you didn't give me a lightning round yesterday, but I feel like the whole interview from one end to the other was lightning. So I hope oh, yeah, everybody watches totally that fun. interview. It was it was amazing though. You are a great interviewer. Thank I'm you. not I'm not I'm not kidding. Okay, so oh next up the lightning round, and this is where I ask questions that Charles has never seen before, and he responds. He fires right back with his pithiest answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Tell us something about one of your real estate markets that most people wouldn't know. That there are bad C-class areas in Fort Worth, <laughs> Texas. How's that one? Okay. All right. So newsflash, there are bad yeah. uh, areas in, in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. Watch out. Uh, so watch out if you just came out of a boot camp uh, and three days later and you think that you're a real estate investor, in other words. Yeah. And don't yeah, don't call Marcus Millichap and use the, I want to buy a C and a B area. Yeah. Never <laughs> okay. call Marcus Millichap. So what is uh, some advice you give your younger self? Oh, that's great. Keep your credit clean. Always, always watch the money and uh, just have fun. Go out and don't run so much. Because when you get to be my age, my feet are killing me all the time from all the marathon running I did. Don't nice. run so much. You don't need to run. So. <laughs> all right. Awesome. I love it. Wide ranging. Okay. Best real estate advice you've ever received or best real estate advice you would like to give our audience today? I already mentioned it and it's uh, go, go to those places that everybody's running out of. Don't go with the crowd. That's how Warren Buffett made his money. And I see it over and over again with Phoenix, with uh, you know Florida. It's happening again. People are just going into these places because that's what everybody else is doing. Absolutely the wrong reason to be going into it. And there's no no reason not to wait right. just wait. you don't have to do something just wait if it's not the right thing don't do it sage advice i'll have to interrupt this uh, lightning round with a couple of uh insights here 
I've, I've seen a lot of people who are doing exactly what you're saying, the brightest people. I think that they are leaving some of those hotter markets. I'm not going to name them, but you know which ones might be overheated. And uh, I'm moving sort of towards the middle band of the country. I'm not, not in the hottest uh, climates, nor the hottest uh, real estate markets. And another one is look into Stefan Svetkov. If you want to have an idea of what might happen in the coming recession, if it's like the last. A lot of reasons to believe it won't be exactly like the last, but there are some parallels and some key differences. So just wanted to throw that out to the audience. I think now, he was on, I think I had Stefan on my podcast. Is he do the, he does a, the real- Realty quant. So, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Oh, that guy's smart. That yes, guy's smart. he is. He's a yep. super bright guy. I'm gonna go on his, I've had him on mine. I learned a lot and I'm actually one of his customers. Okay, I'm a I was client wondering. of Realty Quants and yes. I believe that uh, for for what for what he gives you for that price, I don't know why uh, it's everybody should be his customer. Really? Go and find out uh, what this guy knows 100%. You you, oh, you will cool. you will thank me later. Yeah, yeah. He's so, so I was going to ask you next, what is the worst real estate advice that you've heard? <laughs> But I think you've given us oh, yeah. half a dozen uh, clunkers that you've heard along the way. Anything you'd like to add on? You know, I, I, I got in a real pissing contest with one woman, one investor on, uh, on that uh, shark pool. Oh, she and I were going at each other. And I'm, I'm just listening to her like she's never been through a bad cycle. She's never had to, had to uh, lose, a, lose a property. And she's telling me how I'm wrong with all my advice. Sometimes, here's my advice to everybody. Sometimes you might want to just sit back and listen because you might learn more by listening than by talking. So uh, that's, you know, that's, you look at somebody that's done it and, and just pick their brain every chance you can. I mean, I, I've been doing it. My, my landlord here in my office building, he's one of the richest guys in New Hampshire where I am. And I go to him all the time just to say, hey, what about this? What do you think about this? The guy's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And, uh, you know, Hey, even I go get advice. <laughs> Killing me. I love it. Uh, so you know what? I feel like if there's ever a time to just shut off the gurus, I feel like yesterday's good advice is today's bad advice. If uh, you're watching a YouTube video from two years ago, turn it off yeah. and figure out what's going on right now. So I yeah. just... I love, love, love it. Okay, Charles, you're just killing me. I knew that this was going to be a hilarious interview. <laughs> I knew it was going to be fact packed, but you just blowing me away. So next, you know All what right. we're going to do? I don't even know what I'm going to ask next. This is a nod to the randomness <laughs> of the universe. I got like a trivial pursuit here. deck you got there. <laughs> it's Jeez. something like this. Yeah, so it, it could be it could be anything from you know what's the uh, African country with the highest GDP, or it could be uh, you know what is your spirit animal. So just tell me when to yeah. stop cutting the deck. Okay, stop. All right, top cards. Oh my gosh, this is wild. <laughs> All right, which historical time period would you most like to visit? Oh, World War II. I want to be a fighter pilot during World War II. Oh, I just think uh, flying a P-38 or a P-51. Oh, that just, that would be the bomb for me. I just, uh, that, uh, I see those old, I watch the, all those uh, old, you know, black and white movies all the time. Uh, of uh, all the, the different fighting that went on and because I'm a pilot too and I love I love those uh, types of things and I just can't get enough about planes and uh, yeah so that's that's an easy one for me uh, my mind goes right back there so yeah by far the deepest answer I've gotten to one of those question cards so far so thank you for that sure next up name a book and I think you've already named a couple that have helped to forge you as an entrepreneur and as a leader Oh, you know, which one that uh, that really has just, and it's a, a one that I recently read and I just had to use it as my first book of the month club for my group is Ready, Fire, Aim. Mm. Ready, Fire, Aim. And, it, you know, for those people looking to get started, uh, starting their own business like multifamily, you might not want to read it. It might, you might, it might save yourself a lot of hassle because what he says is all business is sales and marketing. And I don't care how good your idea is, if you can't sell it, you're never going to go anywhere. And that's the biggest problem that I have with, with my clients who never do anything. They sign up with me and they never do anything. It's because they are afraid to sell and market themselves. And what you have to understand is, and I, I ask this, who are your customers? One of your customers is the owner of the property you're looking to buy. He's your customer. 
And here's why. You have to sell him on your offer and he has to accept it and buy your, off, buy your offer. That's, a, that's the sale that has to take place. If that sale doesn't take place, you're not, gonna, you, you're not in this business. So you're not in this business until some owner accepts your offer. And once they do that, you're, you're in the game. The problem is it's a sales and marketing business. You got five other life insurance agents going yeah. to see the same guy offering them their contract. And he gets to choose which one he likes. You have to write your offer so that it rises to the top and gets accepted. And so, and also sales and marketing is just a numbers game. I asked, so I haven't done anything. I haven't, nobody's, you know, uh, the offers aren't good. You know, a, how many offers have you made? Well, I made two in the last three months. No, that's not how this works. It's a sales, it's a numbers game. You can't succeed in this business by just making two offers. You got to be, that's your job. You're going to be pounding the pavement every single day, making offers. So that's the, um, that's the, what I learned from that Ready, Fire, Aim book. Amazing. And now I know you've hit us with this once before, uh, but for those who might've just skipped to the end, uh, how has a failure or misstep set you up for later success? Oh my gosh. I, I think I'm an, I am the best mentor coach in this business, bar none, because of the mistakes that I have made. So I wouldn't have the success I'm having now if I hadn't been through that fire and learned those things. Learn it. It's like I had to learn it so that my students and my clients wouldn't have to go through it again. Uh, so that's the way that's my all my I, I think I said this before and, and I'll let you in on something, George. I said it to you yesterday. You used it already in this in this conversation uh, where the, the quote is success is a lousy teacher. And I said I, some famous guy said this. I know exactly who it is. I just don't talk about him anymore. His name is Bill Gates. And, you know, for, uh, for obvious reasons, I, I don't use him as a, as a sage anymore um, with all his trips down to that island. So, uh, but his advice was good. Success is a lousy teacher. And uh, that's why my failures have made me a great teacher. Amazing. And I think with that, uh, we can't go any higher. That was a perfect <laughs> way to end it. Thank Charles, you, George. Thank you so much uh, for coming here today and uh, sharing your insights with our audience. Thank you. That was fun. Awesome.